Right. Well, welcome back to another DT Wellbeing podcast with me, DT. Now, guys, today I am delighted to have a dub. We won't hold it against them, but Shane Carey, <laughs> <laughs> Shane and I, you know, we've got a kind of circuit doing a lot of kind of similar stuff, but I'm going to let Shane introduce himself properly to you guys. But what I know about Shane, Gaelic footballer, again, another tick in the Daniel Toomey book, mental head advocate, another tick in the Daniel Toomey book, and also, um, a re- recently turned published author, which you know what? Respect where it's you. So Shady, what you might do, because I always get these things wrong, give yourself a bit of an intro to the gang and maybe tell us how you got into this whole world of kind of mental health advocacy and things like that. Because I know you do loads of talks in schools and things like that. So let the audience yeah. know what you're up to. Yeah, perfect. And thanks very much for that. Um, quite, quite a <laughs> long-winded, very, very uh, covered um, introduction there. Really, really appreciate it. <laughs> Deserved, man. It's, it's, it's funny even there at the, at the end when you're saying recently published author, I think I still have this kind of imposter syndrome. Like, oh, that's that's me, you know? Um, it, it's, it's hard to think. And I was just um, saying, I, I might as well say it now because it was a joke that I was going to say towards the end of the podcast. And I already mentioned to Shane off camera, but or off video. I was training at science this morning via Zoom, like online science, and towards the end of the personal training session, she goes, Daniel, have you read this book? You've got to read it. This girl's from New York. And I was like, I'm speaking to Shane in an hour. I let him know that you enjoy his book. Tell us, Shane. Incredible, yeah. So basically, kind of to give you a little context uh, where I came from, so I grew up in Port Marnock, uh, north side of Dublin. And in primary school, I was cast into absolutely every single sport possible. Gaelic, soccer, hurling, swimming, you name it. Um, and I guess from the outset, uh, a common theme throughout my story is I was seen as this pedestal-like figure, this limelight mm-hmm. figure living this great life. Um, and it probably was in around that time. Um, in particular, my two loves were uh, Gaelic and soccer. I didn't know what I wanted to do at, at that particular stage and such an early juncture of my life. Um, mm-hmm. I had dreams and aspirations of playing for Manchester United one day and up on top of the Hogan Sand Steps and Crow, and Crow Park. So I was torn between the two. Um, inevitably, as uh, as you've introduced me as a Gaelic footballer, I, I obviously chose Gaelic football, um, and I really kind of went down that path uh, in the middle of the fourth year, where you could say um, your Dublin career really does begin. Okay. Um, and that's that was kind of my focus. That was my drive. That was my goal. That was my life. And um, mm. around that time, and uh, representing the Dublin minor footballers, and um, having that tag as a, as a Dublin footballer, um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, respect and towards you. Um, yeah, you know, in terms of how people see you, how people perceive you, um, mm-hmm. and I guess you know straight away, and I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. Uh, really, really enjoyed people kind of noticed me for who I was, and uh, continued along that trend. Um, mm. And my story, would be where we kind of get into the mental health advocacy kind of stuff, um, would have been in the middle of fifth year. Okay, where I didn't know then what I now know was to start my depression. Mm. Um, as I, say, I was living this idyllic life, and mm. looking in, you know. Uh, this Dublin Gaelic footballer living this great life but little did they know um, that was going to be a start of a two year journey um, okay. which toward the end brought me to the, to the point of suicidal ideation mm. um, which is the stark reality um, yeah. of what I was faced with and, and I guess as I say you know I continued along the trend and, and I'm sure you can all relate in terms of your listeners kind of coming in here in terms of that physical exercise those happy endorphins that you release mm. that's my crutch my medication at that time um, yeah in, in particular, you know, what I was going through this period of knowing none the wiser what was going on for me. Yeah. Um, and as I say, kind of fast forward the story, after two years, um, I found myself in St. Patrick's Mental Hospital. Yeah. Um, and that's where my, my journey back from the edge really began. Um, okay. I started, I guess, unearthing what uh, what exactly was going on for me. Because um, I didn't know for those two years. I didn't know mental health. I didn't know depression. Yeah. I didn't know anything. Um, and I guess then from, from there, you know, after St. Pat's kind of rebooting up my mind back into society with a new kind of outlook on life. And um, yeah. I guess I had to stand up on the pedestal that everyone see me up on. Um, and that's how I got into the, the mental health kind of realm or world that um, both of us find ourselves in, I guess. Yeah, and brilliant, yeah. mate. Brilliant. And like so many crossovers there. Other than the level of football and athletic ability you have, there's a lot of similarities <laughs> between us. But look, that's super story, Shane. And how long ago would, have been, would, it, would that have been, you know, kind of when you were the, at the worst point of your mental health story? Yeah, you know? I think the worst point, um, which would have been coinciding with the end of the two years. Uh, so we're talking about 2014. 2014, okay. it would have been 19 years of age. Um, where I would okay. Have been in the hospital. So. Um, such an early age, you know, very yeah. little kind of experience in life. Um, 
and, and very little experience around mental health in general. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, and that's it. Um, but yeah, I, I can t- I can empathize, and also I just have an understanding. But what I, more than anything else, I just have so much admiration and respect because that pedestal, even though it might have been a disadvantage once upon a time, has now opened this door for you to inspire young lads and young girls that are going to listen to your story. And you know, having that platform to do it, whether it's from Gaelic football or other ways, it's just opened this door for you to do all this great work, which like undoubtedly you're doing which is really really great to see so like what has been the biggest change for you in that kind of you know in, the, in those years like what do you do now uh, in terms of like coping mechanisms or lifestyle choices or self-care what are you doing now Shane that you weren't doing when you were 19 years of age mm-hmm. yeah and it's, and it's very apt to this day you know I think a lot of us are looking for those coping mechanisms in particular mm. in, in these COVID times Mm. And I guess when I look back, I didn't have what I had actually coined in, in St. Pat's as my mental health toolbox. Um, okay. I back, yeah. That little visual yeah. there of having yeah. a toolbox there, having tools and, you know, to rely upon on these good yeah. and bad days. Because, you know, as we both do, as everyone does, has their good and bad days. Yeah. Um, and what the difference was, I guess, um, on the bad days, I simply wasn't coping. I was keeping yeah. it within. Um, I didn't have anything to rely upon. Mm. And when I built up these tools and resources in St. Pat's in terms of, if I talk about my top three things, it would be physical exercise, of course. Yes. You know, I, I don't think that comes as a surprise. That got me through the two years. Good man. The worst part of my life. Um, and, you know, number two, I guess, would be kind of a playlist or a podcast. And, nice. you know, bring me to a happier time and place. I'm sure you can relate there. In terms yeah. Of it's happy, even endorphins that you release, kind of listen to a song, remind me of a place, that kind of thing, you know. For sure, for sure. Yeah, and, and number three then, I guess, would be just opening the floor to my friends, whether it be, mm. you know, face-to-face or I'll be through Zoom these days. Um, yeah. Just de-stressing, saying, look, I'm having a bit of an issue with work, college, relationships, whatever it may be. Um, and I guess it's very important to say, and I actually have a funny story on this, uh, <laughs> in terms of how these uh, cope mechanisms kind of take a, a life of their own, mm. in terms of very, very individualistic. Um, as I talk about my time in St. Pat's, I was in what was called your adult program for 18 to 25 year olds. I suppose I'd be remiss of I'd be remiss of me now to say this to you, not at this juncture, or to let it slide again. But I was on the same program when in 2008. I was on the young adult program. I was a little bit older than you, but I know what you're talking yeah. about. But I just I never yes. told you that before, so I was like, all right, I, he's mentioned twice now. I better say, but same program, same path, same hospital. But I know what you went through. Go on, tell me what was what yeah. was. It was it, it was that um it was the group therapy session as as you you will be familiar with that that's mm. that's so funny such a small world that you found yourself in in that so, kind of uh, area. Honestly, and I was I was twenty two but the same hospital the same young adult program years before and a little bit older but I know exactly mm. what you're talking about and you know there might not be I'm sure there are other listeners that would have some experience and you know being in a similar setting whether it's same Pat's or not but I just wanted you to know that I know exactly what you're talking about so go on tell me about your young yeah. adult uh, program so, experience. Yeah, so that's setting of the, the young adult program. We're in a group therapy session and we we're talking about uh, CBT, as it were, at the, at the time. And then we went around the room, we we're closing off the meeting and we we're talking about, okay, what, what does everyone here have in, in their mental health toolbox? And of course, I'm talking mm. about you know, physical exercise, my playlist, my podcast, you know, speaking to people. And it turns to the right of me as, uh, as it were, a 20 year old male. And uh, he talks about um, how he does knitting. And I was looking at him with 10 heads thinking, hey, <laughs> if you're 20 years of age, what, what are you knitting for? <laughs> uh, nevertheless, the, the next day I found myself in group therapy and knitting away. Oh, good and, uh, <laughs> um, my dad absolutely came me for it. It didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. But I think it just kind of encompasses that kind of thing of, I was 19 years of age, physical exercise worked for me. Yeah. He was 20 years yeah. of age, knitting work for him. You know, yeah. so it's very individualistic. Go after what works for you, makes you yeah. tick, makes you happy. Yeah. And put it into that toolbox so yes good man good man and that's exactly right because you know what works for you might necessarily work for me and vice versa and it's just finding those things that make you healthy and happier and we're no one we're feeling good we know when we have this positive energy like take note of what you're doing at that time and like i get it i don't knit myself but i get it's like you're mindful you can't be anywhere else when you're knitting and it brings you into the yeah. moment so i could see why that's beneficial you're sporting at the time right or you're talking about the physical activity next so it's helped you right and i you know i think like physiologically um, everybody on the planet would benefit from exercise but what's different about you is that you played getting football at such a high level and you know as you said around that time you were even a county minor footballer so very high level do you feel as well as the exercise and the physical activity that kind of community and your teammates and having a place to go and a routine and you know out of obligation even though we mightn't feel up to it being needing to be at the GA 
um, you know, I'd done the J club to train at a certain time at a certain, and having, do you think that helped you as well? Massively, yeah. And I, and I actually think that's a, that's a good kind of lead into, um, you know, these COVID times, how people can, you know, cope in it. Um, as you mm. talked about structure there, what mm. that like, actually given me was, as you say, a time, a place, um, a certain accountability of myself to be somewhere, mm. uh, to perform and to kind of diffuse my mind, I guess, because when mm. I had seen the football pitch as, was my safe haven. Yeah. That's my safe haven, you know, you know, the kind of way. So I guess as, as you touched upon there, that kind of structure piece, hugely, yeah. hugely important. And actually, I brought upon a kind of structure piece that I went away from for a couple of years and um, just prior to COVID, but kind of coming into this COVID piece, it was very reminiscent of my time in St. Pat's. And um, as I'm sure you know, it's from your experience there, you're kind of locked down to a confined area, a certain, yeah. you know, um, a certain set of things to kind of rely upon and resources that you have to deal with. You have to make the best of. And I guess with these restrictions in terms of, the, you know, within your 5K, everything else, it's yeah. important to make use of what you have around you. So what I've actually done was when it sat down in lockdown one, I uh, can't even mm. remember what lockdown we're in now. We don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess, you know, lockdown one there was a thing of setting a structure to my day. And how I'd actually built upon that was I got a calendar and I had it marked out. I had the, the full year, full year in the calendar. And I looked each week of where I was at, what I had to do in terms of one thing each day that I wanted mm. to plan that would bring me to a happier time and place. Inevitably, that would be physical exercise. Number two would be a non-negotiable. So for both of us, for everyone around the world, is work, probably Monday to Friday. Something we more than likely probably don't want to do, but it's a non-negotiable. Yeah. We have to, you know, we have to put the yeah. bread on the table. Yeah. And then the third thing is actually to have something to stimulate your mind. In in my form, it was reading. Uh, and, and as I see, and I see in the picture behind you, so to stimulate your mind, you do a lot of reading yourself. Um, it's all so it's, pretentiousness is what I do. Pretentiousness is what I do. You can, <laughs> tell, how, you can tell how pretentious a person is on their, their background for their Zoom call, but continue, Shane. Well observed. I'm, I'm looking at my black blank background here. Is that something yeah, behind me? Exactly. <laughs> what did I say? You're humble, you're mild mannered, and I have a show off. Continue. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that, that that's how I worked upon it in terms of you know that structure there, those three things, something to look forward to, a non-negotiable, something to stimulate my mind. And I guess that gave me that bit of focus, that accountability that I had when everything was back in the normal kind of times in terms of I had to go to train, I had to go to work, I had to go to college. Um, yeah. And I just tried to tailor to what we find ourselves in to this day. And I guess that would be, and I hope it's a, it's a massive help in hand for people to kind of use that and build upon yeah. it again, yeah. as I talk about the individual nature, tailor it to what works for you. That's a great idea, Shane. And people could take that template. And even though the categories might be the same, the activity will be different and it'll work for them. But yeah, like solid, solid advice. Um, like that was the premise of setting this podcast up. So I did it. Uh, I set this up last March when the original lockdown, to answer your question, was March 2020. Seems like a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Coming into March 2021 now. But um, yeah, so I set up this podcast with just the premise of using my social media platform to maybe, you know, have discussions about what makes people healthy, happy during these times. And at the time, I had no idea that we'd still be doing it 12 months later. But now that we are and we've kind of organically got to this point, what are other than what you've told me already your, your tips for like you know what works for Shane in terms of your own health and happiness no has it is it the same as it was when I was 19 has it evolved to incorporate a few different activities you mentioned reading is there anything that you do or anything else that you might recommend to others or what are your thoughts about practical positive like pastimes that you do to make you feel better or could you recommend yeah so we even add on that and again um as i say it, you know my 19 year old self isn't the same as, as i am to this day in 26 years of age no because i've gone through a journey i've gone through life um, and as i went into each kind of segment of my life so say for example college and um, you know when i was in the busyness of college when i was around in busy lecture rooms a lot going on people buzzing around i'd mm. actually had a little kind of spot in, in the car park i'd take myself back to the car and do a bit of kind of mindfulness meditation and um, i don't know if you're familiar with the um headspace app yeah yeah i, I, started, I started using that um, and yeah. as kind of just a little diffuser if I, I felt myself a bit kind of anxious a bit worked up just to take myself out of the busyness of college and um, so that was kind of the thing that i found myself in then um, and now it's kind of work and do my talks and um, you know particularly say for my talks i always just kind of check in with myself i always after i do you know my public speaking events because i'm regurgitating the past i'm regurgitating yeah. the past yeah. I'm regurgitating yeah. things that i never would have told anyone about yeah yeah. Uh, so I'm very, very careful in terms of kind of checking in, am I all there? And how I actually help with that, and I think for a lot of listeners, um, one thing would actually be, and it's no 
absolutely no shame to, to go to a psychologist. I've actually just yeah. come from my psychologist this morning. Good man. Um, I check in with every couple of weeks. And the way I kind of see it is an NCT for my mind. You know, you go yeah. to, you, you get a checkup in your car every six months or a year, whatever it may be. And I think even if I have things that I don't think I have, you know, that are, you know, building up on me or, or pressurized or anxiety kind of stuff, I kind of just go to him and verbalize that and just make sure everything is in check. Make sure everything is oiled up and, uh, and I'm ready to go. So that could be a thing that people could, you know, be again, as I say, through Zoom or through a phone call. It's just yeah. to check in. Yeah. Just don't let it get to a point of a crisis point of I need to do something now. Why not keep on top of it? As I t- talk about my physical exercise, you know, yeah. Kevin just keeps on top of that. Let's just yeah. keep on top of my health, you know? I love it. I love it. I love it. And it, being proactive as opposed to reactive, and not thinking about our health only when we're ill. Let's think about our health every day and just make sure that yes. we maintain it. Whether it's physical, yeah. mental, spiritual, emotional, just let's maintain this kind of homeostasis and just make sure that it's not, you know, limit the potentiality of us dipping, whether it's physically or mentally. And yeah, the same, we have a great counseling service here in Trinity and I've been engaged with them since I got here. And often it's just for that chats, just touching base, making sure that we're emotionally and mentally I am where I should be. And as long as I get to take from the NCT operator, I move on and I, I drive out of there. Uh, so she had really respect uh, for that. And I just think for everybody, it's just like, yeah, it's just why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? You know, it's just, it's, it's a, it, there's a service out there that we should be all availing of, I think. Um, but yeah, great. And um, how did you find like, first of all, so you're, you're counseling as you mentioned and you're a psychologist like how do you feel um regarding you or your contemporaries or your peers or lads your age where are we at in terms of a country providing services uh for you know individuals mental health needs are, are it, was it easy for you to find that psychologist how did it come about is it since your St. Pat's days you stick you stuck with it or how did it come for you and where are we at as a country yeah, so, so I guess from where I came from in, in 2012, 2013, uh, mental health wasn't spoken about. And, mm. you know, from a selfish point of view, I would love to have someone in the in the shape of me coming to the school and talking yeah. about mental health in around that time because it simply wasn't a topic. I don't think we we really kind of approached as a country or took it seriously enough um, yeah. in around that time. And I guess I was in, from my own personal point of view, I was in such a fortunate position of being a Dublin senior footballer that yes. I had contacts yes. to let me into St. Pat's. And, um, you know, that, that led me, which led me to that point. And then to have contacts there for psychologists that I went to see, you know, four or five years after and every couple of months at this stage. Yes. And not everyone has that. Uh, you know, I found in particular since the release of this book, and I'm sure you found it as well through a lot of messages for your listeners, that I had someone there, I think it was a 19 year old male, had contacted me just one message of, of thousands that I'm getting. And he'd said, I've had to wait six months. Um, for an appointment with a psychologist and this isn't a thing of like oh I broke my leg I need to get a, you know this is a broken mind and a lot of people's situations are life or death and to tell you have to wait yeah. six months it's just adding to the statistics of where we're at with the country because if I'm right in saying I think we're fast tracked to be you know one of the highest suicide rates in, in Europe um, yeah, we are. Yeah. You are. Um, yeah. and, and that's the thing I, I think we've come a long way to kind of kind of go back to where I think we are. I think we've come a long way since 2012. I do yeah. I do believe that. Yeah. I do think we, we have. A lot of things have been put in place, but I still think the government are lagging way, way behind in terms of the services that need to be provided on a day-to-day basis. This isn't a thing of you need to wait five or six months. It can't because yeah. a lot of, as yeah. I say, it's life or death for a lot of people. And um, so I guess between what I'm trying to do, what you're trying to do, what other kind of mental health advocates are trying to do is to keep this kind of conversation alive. Because yeah. as you say, it's a day-to-day thing. It's a day-to-day thing. It's not something you just think about one day and you kind of drop it. Your mental, you know, your mental state is with you every single day in terms of everything you decide to do. And if that's not in tip-top shape, you know, we're going to find ourselves in a, in a very, very bad situation, which we probably are at the minute. For sure, for sure. And like what I, 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 I totally agree with what you're saying there regarding the, you know, my mental health um, incident and crisis was in 2008. Yours was four years later. And we are seeing development. And I just think as a society, people like you and I, our age, our generation, the biggest shift and difference in our generation than our parents will be our mindset and our comfortability talking about issues pertaining to mental health, right? We're all do like now we have people that are of our age standing up and a little bit older than us that can stand up and talk about this stuff. And Mm. 
up until very recently, we may have considered ourselves the youth of Ireland, but now we are just the new, we are our young Ireland. We, like, we are the people that are going to make these decisions. And if the government aren't putting things in place for us right now, well, like, we will be the lobbyists and we will be put, putting the pressure on the government to start, you know, putting these services together because we need it as a society. Yeah. And you and I both know how important it is. And we both come from privilege. Like you had your mm-hmm. getting football uh, community to help you to get in the same paths. And I had my parents and, you know, health uh, insurance and things like that. But we're the mm-hmm. minority. And yeah. every single person has mental health, but a lot out of a lot of this country have mental illness. And if they're not being looked after, well, what's the point in having the government and the health service look after us? So I'm in agreement. I'm in a full agreement. But I think, I think in the last generation, which a lot of, you know, the politicians that are there now may still be, you know, a bit older than us. And my parents just wouldn't have been comfortable talking about mental health and their contemporaries and peers wouldn't have been. So they're not putting pressure on the government to introduce something that they're not comfortable talking about. Whereas Shane, I feel as though you're doing what the w- country and the world at large wants people to do, to talk about mental health, normalize discussion and show the importance of these services. And because, you know, it's so important, but it's great. And like, you're done it with the book. Like, tell me about this book. And uh, <laughs> I, I honestly told you, I could not believe it. I was like, I was like, do you get information? Were you talking to Shane? Did he tell you I'm talking to him? No, I was like, no literally, yeah. Christina Varad from New York City is like, you got to read this book, Daniel. So that was you. Tell me. How did That's I come about God, how it all came about. And, I, and I'm absolutely blown away. And, and I've had so many instances like that of people all over the world. And, and I just, I, I, I still can't believe it. Um, you know, well myself, done, mate. Uh, well done. Here. Who, who who am I? I guess who who am I? But you know, very very proud, really really proud. And how it kind of all came about was um back in 2018. So I just finished up my undergraduate degree in sports science, and I was thinking, okay, I want to take a year out here. It's um you know fairly heavy after a thesis, and I just want to kind of diffuse and kind of you know relax, explore uh, different bits and pieces. And one of that uh, away from sport was actually mental health. And I've been giving talks around the country for a number of years at that stage. I was thinking, okay, this is confined to a certain area, a certain place, a certain number of people. How can I reach a wider audience? So I thought about what I actually referred to Connor Cusack, uh, former Cork cur- cur- curler, yeah. yeah. in a blog only years previous. And I never went on his talks. I actually just clicked on it. Um, it was one o'clock in the morning and I was sat there just reading it and I could relate to it so much. And I was thinking, Brilliant. that's a great platform Brilliant. to have. We're all in our, uh, you know, all on our phones. We're all at a click of a button away from something. So I mm-hmm. said, right, I'm going to write a blog you know, around the skeleton of these talks that I'm doing. So I'd written a blog and put it out there. Very, very hesitant to do so. It's not easy to put your head above water. Um, no, no. And, and I was thinking the reason why I'm trying to do this is to reach a wider audience, to have an effect for their field. And so much so, it's it, it blown up um, a lot more than I thought it would. Um, and one of the offers that actually came in was from the O'Brien Press. Um, I'll never forget that I was in work and I got an email off the O'Brien Press and it came up, Michael O'Brien, um, all official the whole lot and high shame we're just, I- I- incredible high shame we're just uh, you know we're discussing your recent blog and we'd love to bring you in for a possible book deal Whoa. I was like is, is this is this one the lads have me on here you know, yeah, I, yeah 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 I, I thought I, I was looking at it it was all official the whole thread and the whole lot so I was like I am Michael yeah great I'll, I'll, just stop and I'll, I'll, I'll come in and talk to you and I just thought it was maybe like you know we hear about these music deals or record deals that fall through the cracks you know I thought it was just maybe a conversation and you know it, something might come from it um, and of course it did it sat down and said look I believe you have a you know a, a platform there to write a very very good book and we believe wow. uh, that's right. incredible incredible and I was thinking and to be honest with you Daniel I wasn't overly academic in school I, I, I got by it was you know average maybe C student across all um, all subjects in particular English yeah, um, and I guess why you know I, I guess the reason for that was probably I was giving more devotion to my sport in life. I was just trying yeah. to get by, you know, leaving certain get on with my life. And um, when that was brought to me, I found it quite funny. I was like, I'll, I'll go away. I'll use the skeleton of the blog, and I'll flesh it out, and I'll come back with a, a bit of a draft. Um, and a big thing for me, I guess, as well with the book was that I had said to them, look, I don't want this to be too journalistic. I want to have my own kind of saying this. I want to have you know the words coming from the page coming from me, so people that yeah. read this yeah. know me is they know it's me speaking they know it's yeah. not all yeah. and journalistic and they, they were absolutely fine with that gave me the brilliant, the, brilliant. Uh, the scope for that which is huge because i just didn't want it to be kind of too i i guess varnished and um, mm. you know it just wanted to be my story and they gave me that um, and 18 months later 
True. Whoa. Yeah, 18 months. 18 months, which is a, a big kind of commitment. And it's really kind of devote each day. And I had days where I'd ride for 20 minutes. I have days where I'd ride for six or seven hours, just depending on how wow. I was feeling. So, so much so, 92,000 words later, um, I sent off the first draft um, off to my uh, wonderful editor, Anna Bryan. And we'd whittled it down after a number of months of editing um, down to 50 or 60,000 words, which inevitably brought up upon the book of, of Dark Blue. And as you say, recently published and just simply blown away. As in that story that you just said there um, about that that woman in New York, like it's it's incredible. incredible. Oh man, oh, look, man. Well, look, amazing. And who says you can't do it? And who says, like you said, like, who am I? You're Shane Carthy and you're making the world a better place. And you got a story that people want to hear and you're going to inspire so many young lads and people in general and myself included. You have since we've started, like I met you, I think day one was probably the, the social minds talk we gave here together, but yeah. we've been kind of in, involved in similar things from the start, but man, just keep doing what you're doing. Write more books, write more blogs, you know, set up whatever you don't, and there's going to be people that will support you and rightfully so, because, you know, we need people like you to do what you're doing, Shane. And, um, just like you, if I was younger and a Shane Carter came into my school, it could have changed my life on an earlier stage. So I just really encourage you to keep doing it, man. And where can we get your book? And like, I'd love to say, am I asking hypothetically and I have your book and I've read it? I haven't, Shane. So how can I buy your book? Tell me where to get it. And the rest of you will give it Big Big book for the book. You can get it from, from Easton's or any local bookshop. Um, you know, the, the sales have been absolutely, even that, have been absolutely incredible. And, um, you know, a lot of people are doing a lot of reading at, at this stage. And as I say, something to stimulate their mind. And they've gotten it from Easton's. They've gotten it from the local bookshops. O'Brien Press as well, their website. And yeah. they'll buy it there. And um, even how proud I am of, you know, we went away and printed 6,000 copies on the 1st of February, Monday the 1st of February. And by Thursday the 4th of February, uh, we're going into reprint uh, for another 6,000 copies, which is, as I well say, done, brother. incredible, incredible. Incredible and like just really, really cool, man. And and more power to you. And the more you can do in the sphere that you're in, doing exactly what you're doing, just the bigger level, go more, go more, go more, go harder. We need it. We need it, man. And like how if there's somebody listening to this podcast and they want to reach out to you as an individual, uh, how could they contact you, Shane? If anybody had any questions or if anybody wants to book you for a public speaking job, how do they reach out to you? Yeah, so on, on any of my social media channels, um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. I haven't quite got the handles there, but I, I'm sure I, uh, most of my social media channels have my uh, my big dark blue book. Uh, that's man. me, if you come across it. So um, either that or through email. I have my email linked in every social media platform. So as yeah. you say, I've been doing talks for, for a number of years, in particular in around this time, very, very busy doing them and absolutely man. Them. So I would love to speak to anyone, anyone at all, far and wide, male, female, of all ages, because as I say, it affects us all. Good man. Well done, Shane. Look, and then, as I said, I won't say it again, but just keep doing what you're doing, all right? Promise me you will. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> all right, look, I'm not going to take any more of your time because you're so busy. But look, mate, so much respect for what you're doing and really appreciative that you've come on today to chat to me. And, you know, we had the crack, but I think there was a lot of real strong messages got across there as well. So really want to thank you for that, okay? So thanks so much, mate. I really, really appreciate it. And, and fair play to for the work that you're doing. You know, getting this message out there as, as much as I'm doing it, you're doing it as well. So um, let's keep doing it, as you say. Fair play, man. And, you know, stronger together. Stronger together. So, look, guys, that's us today. Uh, I'll be back in next week with another guest talking about stuff that I know nothing about. Uh, but this evening, we had Shane. And, guys, thank you so much for being with us. And, Shane, thank you. You're an absolute star. So, thanks so much. All right, mate? And we'll see you again. Appreciate it. Take it thanks. easy, guys. And you know it's nothing but love.